and welcome to HDU Community Stories. I'm Executive Director Jenna Heilman, and I'm so thrilled to have a fantastic group of advocates and loyal supporters of HDO share their experiences about talking to the FDA in a listening session, but then also their experiences with just, just advocating in general for themselves and then for the greater community. So I'll let them introduce themselves and I'll start off with one of HDO's founders, BJ View. Yeah, hey Jenna, thanks for having me. Uh, BJ View, co-founder of, uh, of HDO, lifelong HD advocate for many, many years. And um, you know what we're gonna talk about today is just finding another way to, to be an advocate in a different capacity. So this was, uh, this was new to me and really um, grateful to partner with Lauren and, and Seth on this and happy to share more. That's great. And Seth is also a board member, but this project was, um, was done as a, as a separate thing from HDO, but we were happy to support it. Seth, if you wanted to introduce yourself. Sure. Yeah. So uh, been involved in HD for uh, 12, 13 plus years. Uh, my mom had had the disease and then I learned about carrying the gene at the age of 20. I'm considered pre-manifest, pre pre-symptomatic, asymptomatic, depending on the term who you speak with. But, uh, you know, really just this was, as BJ mentioned, kind of first first time doing it um, and just, you know, excited to talk more about it and ways for others to perhaps get involved uh, within their local community too. Fantastic. And last but certainly not least, Lauren Holder. Um, with help for HD Live, I do the podcast. I've also been a lifelong advocate for 16, almost 17 years. I had to think about that for a second. Um, and yeah, I'm super excited that we got to um, do this with the FDA and, and we found a new way of really um, just helping the HD community and moving um, research forward. So yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to have you here. And I'd love to start off just with the antithesis of this idea. So Seth and BJ, how in the world did you ever think of scheduling a time or even approaching the FDA to have this listening session? Go for it, Seth. Man, wow, give me the, give me the reins. Uh, so it, the idea kind of started probably last summer when you know, BJ and I have our like weekly, bi-weekly catch-up rants or just ideas, innovation opportunities. And, uh, you know, he's always willing to give me feedback on, you know, the different speaking engagements that I'll do or like the podcasts I've been on and, you know, kind of talked about how I continue to share about like this idea of, you know, I'm good now and one step at a time and let's stay positive. And I am still positive, but kind of like, okay, how do we actually move the needle? Right. And how do we, really bring change and that's when we started to think about how do we get you know people who are considered pre-symptomatic involved in clinical trials mm -hmm. to actually qualify and so we started just reaching out to different stakeholders you know researchers uh, neurologists pharma companies uh, patient advocacy organizations patients themselves just trying to understand what was the bottleneck and we'd get you know different answers and whatnot but a lot of the common theme was you got to talk to the FDA, you got to talk to the FDA and you got to figure out what, what they're looking for and, and what we can do to really bring the community voice. And so, you know, BJ and I thought, why not try to do this as, you know, individuals, you know, patient advocates to really bring all stakeholders together to really understand what does the FDA want out of this? How do we really accelerate research, uh, bring more urgency kind of use a page out of the HIV AIDS uh, epidemic that happened in the, you know, late eighties where, you know, people were dying and we're like, they're like, we got to do something now. We can't just wait. And so we're like, well, what, what can we do now? What's in our control? And that's kind of how it started. But BJ, did I miss anything? You did awesome stuff. No, like spot on word for word, what I would have said. Um, the only thing I would add is, yeah, we didn't really know what we were doing. You know, the conversations we had just kind of led us to this opportunity <clears throat> where I think we were fortunate to be in the U.S. is our you know, governing body, the Food and Drug Administration, who administer or oversees clinical trials and, uh, and approve products. You know, they have a handful of tools that they put into place about 10 years ago, um, one of which is this patient listening session. So, 
you know, Seth and I didn't know much other than, you know, we stumbled upon this opportunity as a, as a way to communicate. And, you know, we're thankful that the FDA has these tools, but um, yeah, I think spot on. We are just kind of uh, pushing the boundaries, not um, just thinking someone else down the hall is, is already doing this. You know, we looked ourselves in the mirror and we said, you know, what, what can we do? Um, what can we do as advocates? You know, if we just keep sitting back waiting for others to do this, like yeah, we don't think it's going to be done fast enough. You know, we're not scientists, but what can we do with our voices and, you know, our passion? And, and this was a perfect project. I think kind of to break it down a little bit too, just to, to have the full story is that we have, especially with HDO, such a community of young people who aren't symptomatic yet. And with research really focusing on people who are exhibiting symptoms that can be measured, that there is this population of people who really are eager to participate in clinical trials, but can't. So is it fair to say that that was really the underlying message that you all wanted to achieve is to share those voices and to see how else you could push it forward from their perspective now that they know a little bit more about, about what people are experiencing? I mean, absolutely. I think for myself, you know, being uh, being an old guy at 31, it's uh, let's we'll, we'll get some laughs because I know I'm the youngest one here, but oldest one at the heart. Anyways, don't uh, throw everybody else underneath the under the bus about ages. <laughs> That's mainly directed at me, which isn't very nice. No, it wasn't. I would have said Jenna, by the way, <laughs> Lauren, BJ. Uh, no, I. I think what, what's interesting is, you know, been involved for such a long time doing the volunteering and, and the fundraising and all that, that like, it's kind of like, okay, I'm running out of time. Like, I knew about this for 11 years. I've been, you know, doing what I can, but then it's like, what else can I do to really bring change uh, in the research side of things? How can I get involved in studies? Because I would see these studies. I'm like, oh, this is cool. But, oh, I don't qualify. Oh, I don't qualify. But how come other people are making these decisions for me? How come I can't get my voice heard to say, I'm willing to take that risk? You know, if it's an oral pill or if it's something that I think is easy to kind of turn off, right? Of take, you know, stop taking something or stop injecting something or whatnot or spinal tap. But I wasn't given that choice. And, you know, that was something that I felt like others in the community uh, related to, you know, talking with even, you know, Lauren and, and others and, we felt like, hey, this was our time to, to do something about it. Lauren, what were your first thoughts when you when you first heard about um, what Seth and BJ were trying to do? I was really excited. Um, it, one, it was very nice to know that I wasn't the only one sitting there thinking, hey, I'm running out of time, um, because that very much is the feeling that you have when these things um, happen, where, you know, Roche and Genentech announced something, just like we had you know, recently with um, Novartis and Unicure and things, as even though though we know there's still hope and there's you know they're still moving forward, the reality is it's a setback of some of some type, and so it we just don't have the time for those setbacks. Mm -hmm. And so when Seth and BJ approached me, I, I was absolutely on board. Um, you know, we allow other people to take on those risks in clinical trials because they're symptomatic. We know that we're gene positive, so why can't we take on the same risk as somebody who's in the beginning stages of the disease? Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't make sense to me that we're not allowed. And I feel like there's a lot of information to gain from people who are pre-symptomatic and gene positive or at risk, um, because such as mental health, right? There, there are so many things in regards to, to mental health that people think, well, that starts when you get HD, but in reality, people who are pre-symptomatic are already experiencing things. So um, I was really excited to be able to help Seth and BJ and kind of just give a voice uh, to it because I, it's awesome what we're doing and it's basically making history. Um, you know, we're setting a precedent, which is amazing. Absolutely. And, and I, I think, oh, go ahead, BJ. I think the one thing that excited us too, you know, when we submitted this application to speak with the FDA back in November of last year, when we first heard back, what, what excited us the most is they said that the FDA had never received a request for a pre-symptomatic population conversation. So they had done these patient listening sessions and, you know, Huntington's disease actually even had a, 
uh, another meeting called the patient focused drug development meeting back in 2014, but it focused very much on people who had disease onset and their caregivers. So it gave us a lot of like, um, a lot of energy and a lot of excitement hearing directly from the FDA that they had excitement from their office about this proposal. So not only was this for the HD community, but you know, Seth and I have had many conversations with other uh, autosomal dominant neurological conditions about doing their own separate patient listening session to advance the understanding of those communities with the FDA. So something that's a, um, you know, a little bigger effect that, that we're excited to hear about. Well, I think that that just shows that you, it's easy to assume. It's easy to assume that they know what's happening, and it's easy to assume that someone has a, approached different organizations, different regulatory agencies, but that's not always the case. And uh, one of my favorite sayings is, you don't know what you don't know until you don't know it, and you all really showcased this uh, unmet arena that the FDA had never even been approached about because the community hadn't approached them. And I think that that just shows the importance of really engaging with different regulatory agencies to share your perspective. Uh, what were some of the fears? Because I know thinking about uh, contacting a, a federal agency can seem a little bit daunting. What were some of the things that, that kept you up at night when you were trying to figure out the plan and ultimately leading up to the meeting? Pick me. Um, I'll go first <laughs> on this one. Um, I think it was it was the fear of not making it an impactful meeting. You know, we have this platform. We had these folks who were attending. Uh, we had some. I'm not going to say naysayers, but we had some folks in the HD community who reached out when they heard we were doing this, saying, "We already talked to the FDA all the time," or you know, "We we did this back in 2010." And, um, and it's like, oh, okay, well then tell us what you did because for some reason, the people at the FDA said yes to our meeting. So they don't say yes to all these. They told us they received thousands of requests and they picked this one. So I, I think it was making sure that this was new content, that this was relevant to the FDA team, whether they knew about HD from these past conversations that we weren't a part of, but maybe they were just brand new to the FDA too. So um, it was hard to know what the FDA already knew. And it was hard to figure out what conversations were already being had from a Huntington's perspective uh, with the FDA. So that's what, what kept me up at night along with the FDA asked us to create a risk benefit community survey and they gave us no guidance on how to do that. They just said, tell us the risks that this population would be willing to take and what you know, benefits they'd hope to receive. And we, we asked a lot of people, we talked to all the pharma companies, hey, what questions should we add? We didn't get much. So Seth and I built this with some help from um, you know, a, a consultant friend, uh, HD community member, Eric Miller and, and Deb Neville. But really Seth and I built that survey out of just kind of we're, we're doing our best here. And was our best going to be good enough for the FDA? Um, that definitely kept me up at night too. You guys Seth, did a great job though. I got to say like, it was such a good job. Um, I know that you guys definitely stressed over it and everything, but you did an amazing job with it. Yeah. Looking back, I think it's also like knowing how much work you put into it. Like, you know, BJ and I, I, I mean, I'll speak for myself. I, I was like, oh yeah, we can do this, which we did, but we didn't, I didn't go into it realizing how much, how many hours we'd have to put into it for like just the survey itself. And then also what kept me up is like, are we providing enough support to our speakers uh, to make sure that they're feeling prepared? And, you know, if I'm feeling nervous, maybe they're also super nervous. Right. And I think the, the survey itself, yeah, I, I would say the, was the data going to be relevant enough? Was it going to be good enough in the eyes of the FDA? Uh, that was always challenging because, yeah, they didn't give us much guidance, guidance. But I think what I've also heard is just it's very tough to gather that type of data of risk benefit because we weren't comparing it to any specific treatment option. It was just kind of like, what's your risk tolerance in, in general in life? And, you know, our hope overall, which we'll probably discuss a little bit later, is this is just a stepping stone um, to something even more impactful and more hopeful. But yeah, that's those two areas of like the prepping uh, as well as the survey is what I was just nervous about to say, is this going to be received well enough or are they going to just kind of be like, 
cool. Here's a golf clap and uh, thanks guys. Appreciate it. Was the, I was just was thinking about this and I haven't ever spoken to you about this before, but was the weight of the community on top of you as well? Because the FDA and the EMA, the European, um, I, I forget what the acronym is, but the regulatory agency in Europe, they tend to be the trend centers when it comes to um, supporting patients and drug development and things like that. So what you do in, with the FDA could have lasting impressions on the whole globe. So did that bring any kind of added pressure as you were starting to prepare Lauren or organize Seth and BJ with, with what this listening session would be? Uh, I don't know, personally, not really. Seth and I tried to reach out to a lot of stakeholders, and I'm telling you, a lot. You know, pharma companies, advocacy organizations, physicians, researchers. And quite honestly, Jenna, I was, I'm still slightly underwhelmed. Now, I'm not saying a patient listening session is going to, you know, take the cure out of somebody's back pocket and we're all good. But, you know, even sending a, a recap of the FDA meeting to a lot of stakeholders. It was 80 plus people on an email. I was a little underwhelmed with the response. Um, even comments, even questions. And I don't doubt there are people who, who were active and engaged, but I don't feel like the community, I don't feel like many of the stakeholders in the HD community really cared that much. And that's being pretty frank. Yeah, my, my thought is this, is when we first mentioned speaking to the FDA, when you say that sentence, everyone's, oh yeah, how can I help? How can I help? And then as soon as, you know, you ask them, hey, this is what we're looking for, for support. And it wasn't everyone. I would say like, you know, we appreciated, you know, HCO, Help for HD, HSA, whoever kind of pushed out the, the survey itself. But I think the same, the, the part that was challenging was more of just like, when someone says, it kind of actually reminded me to be honest and not to like steer this away, but kind of like when my mom passed, hey, I'm here for you if you need anything. And when you reach out and they're not actually there for you, it's kind of a similar concept of like, hey, what do you need? Like, yeah, I'm in, count me in. And then you follow up a couple of times and then it's just crickets. And I think that's what, you know, for me, it was kind of like, hey, this is what we need to do now to get people, you know, aligned with what we're trying to do. We're not trying to step on toes. We're not trying to, you know, overpower anyone. It's just like, we're trying to bring people together and bring the patient voice involved because without patients, there aren't any trials, there aren't any potential opportunities here. And so how do we make sure that our voices are being heard and we're getting a seat at the table. I mean, I know it's very cliche of the patient at the table, but fortunately you don't see it as often as we talk about it. And so I think this is where we can start to change that scenario and say, hey, we're gonna help kind of, you know, be a part of this throughout the whole kind of clinical trial experience for patients. But that's just kind of my, my initial thoughts. Uh so I think it's a perfect example of what of what we've been trying to do, though, guys, like we knew that that we didn't have a voice. Right. Like, and that's what we're trying to provide. And so sending that out and not getting a response, I'm not really surprised because it's why we started this is the fact that that we needed to give this subgroup a voice. Um, so I can't say I'm surprised that there was a lack of response, um, you know, do I wish it was different? Absolutely. I wish that, you know, I wish that we could see more collaboration and we could see, you know, more of that, uh, what we experienced that day and the impact in the HD community. Um, because you're right, Seth, it does feel like, like that. Oh, I'm here for you. Oh, you know, we're, we're always here. And then there's nothing. So, um, but again, that's why it's why we spoke up. It's why we went to the FDA and, and presented the patient side of this. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I, I'm just excited that we did it. Um, you know, I'm excited about next steps because it's not going to be easy, but we have to do it, right? Like we've just shown the whole reason why we have to do it. So next steps, here we come, um, you know, and we'll do it with or without the support.
Well, yeah, I, mean, I, I don't mean, I just want to say two more things, Jenna, sorry. I, I don't think it's all a, a negative, but I, I think it's also like, we, we were really trying to work with people, right? Like if, if our, if this strategic approach isn't in line with the broader vision or other people's plans, like we want to hear that. And, you know, we think we have an approach for the next step, but, you know, we're trying to share that with folks and, and get a yes, no, maybe, maybe you should think about this. Like we're trying to get everybody's perspective, but it's, it's been harder than we, we thought. Um, and then just from a, you know, like a pre-symptomatic community population, like, I don't know if there is that much weight. And Jenna, I think this is something HDO can continue to push and, and pressure, but I, I still see and hear from so many, let's call them younger people who just keep saying, you know, there, I know there's no cure or treatment today. And it's like, well, well yeah, but like, you got to know that the, the treatments are trending downward into the population who doesn't have symptoms yet. And I don't, I don't think the the HD community pre-symptomatic population is like awake enough to, to understand that because it's really hard to understand and pay attention to the 75 different trials going on and there's failures here and failures there. But I, I do think we need to wake up the pre-symptomatic population of, of patients a little bit more to say, hey, this is changing and this could change quickly. And you could help us do that too by using your voice or participating or using your skills in some capacity. Well, I think too, kind of one of the things I was going to spin off of is very similar to what you just said, BJ, about um, one, this is the first time that this has been done for this specific community. And if it did happen 10, 12 years ago, that's a, that's a whole generation of people. So uh, I think taking the first step is always the hardest thing to do. And so by showing the, and, and having interviews and conversations like this that we can post on social media where people can maybe hear about it for the first time if they're bogged down by email blasts and things like that where they're getting some of this information. And it can be exhausting if you are um, super engaged in other capacities to think of like one more thing. But I think continuing to encourage that involvement and, um, and the ease of the involvement too. I mean, it doesn't take much to complete that survey. And so, you know, just those little things really help out. And, um, and I think it's too important that, that these are people who can be at risk. They could be gene positive. They could be sharing their perspective um, of gene negative because I know that there's a lot of, there's, there's more surveys that are coming out. And so I think there's a little bit for everybody in the community, whether or not they have gone through genetic testing or whether or not they are vocal advocates, this is just a way at the comfort of their own home to participate. And so I think that really continuing to echo those things throughout the community is going to be really important, but it's not going to happen in one foul swoop. And um, I think that this is going to be a long working process to continue to um, engage and encourage and create that awareness about what's going on and, the, and how they can help. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. And I think, um, you know, the other thing is when you first learn about it as a young person, you kind of like trying to grasp it of saying, okay, what does this mean for my future? What does this mean for just you know being at risk and then going thinking about testing, not to test? And you know, you hear kind of the terms of like there could be a treatment right around the corner, or you know, we're we're getting closer, or you know, last generation to deal with this. And it's like, I get it, and I again it's I think the big thing is also trying to manage your own expectations. And that's what I personally have learned over the years of like, okay, even with the Roche study, that was a phase three, going into phase three, like I heard about it, I was excited, but I was like, let's see what ends up happening first, because I don't want to get back into that, like get all excited. And then if what happened, happened, and I'm just like, oh, this, this stinks. I mean, it does, but like, at least I'm, I try to mentally prepare myself to say, this is the best case, this is the worst case, let's see where it falls, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, the big thing I would say for this, just to kind of spin it, is like we learned a lot from this community through that survey. Uh, and, and, you know, very excited as we kind of dive deeper into the data uh, from, you know, it was 164 qualified responses, like seeing what people really need you know, are they looking for support when it comes to travel reimbursement for studies? How often are they going to see a doctor? Are, what's their willingness to 
participate in a study you know what's you know there's there's just all these all this insight that we're excited to share with everyone because we're at the end of the day we're like whoever wants it have it like we're we're uh all ears and just want to kind of collaborate i think too it's it's important I think that this community can oftentimes feel overlooked or forgotten about until if they if they do develop the disease, the symptoms uh, become known. And I think that just to continue to share the message that this is a way that you can that you are not forgotten about. You can share your experiences, just like you said, Seth. The the challenges of participating in a clinical trial are real challenges. You have to take time off of work. You know, do you have to travel? What is the delivery method of of treatment? Uh, what does that mean to your family nucleus? There are all these different things, and and the community, the companies who are putting on these clinical trials, the doctors, they all need to understand what these limitations are to help either educate you on what the real experiences can be, what they can do to help out, or develop programs that are much more convenient for people to participate in. And the only way you, you can't just sit back and feel forgotten about if it with this incredible opportunity to make change by providing uh, some small answers. Uh, that's, it makes a big difference. I think too, that we got to think back to when we were 15 years old, Seth, and how like, okay, we found out about this. We're going to research it. Now we're gung ho. And as life happened, you know, and things start happening and you get busy with your life, like you can't do as much. You can't be as involved. And um, so I think not only are we dealing with people who are gene positive, pre-symptomatic early, early, like, okay, everybody keeps telling me live my life. I don't need to worry about it now, right? So we have that going on. And then we have the other group of pre-symptomatic people who are just living their lives, right? Life is busy and they're also caregivers. And, you know, they're in their late twenties, early thirties, like us that are, you know, they've got kids, they're trying to navigate just life and a lot of them are caregivers and a lot of them are just overwhelmed and, and how things are right now. And I think that plays a part in it too, um, because we only have so much energy. Um, so, you know, what are they going to devote their energy to? And, um, I, I think that's one of the hurdles that we're, we're facing as well. Um, I'm not sure how to get over that hurdle. I'm not sure what to do, but I definitely think it involves conversation. And I definitely think that there is room for improvement when it comes to providing resources and services for this subgroup. Um, because if we're delving into hey, we want you involved in these things, we have to have resources available too to deal with the overwhelmed, I can't handle any more just fall that happens, um, which does. I mean, everybody feels that. Um, so it just has to be there, um, which is what, you know, HDO is there for and help for HD and, and support groups and everything, but not everybody knows or feels safe at those support groups right now. Mm -hmm. um, or that they even fit in because they're pre-symptomatic. It's the whole reason I don't go to a support group. So I was just going to say, yeah, I mean, it's, especially, you know, if you're in the same home, you know, same town or same, like, you don't like for me, right. Like my dad has his own support group. I'm not going to, I've gone to it, but I'm also like, you know, and I am close to my dad, but at the same time, it's like, there's certain things that I probably would prefer to share in my own little group of like other young adults or other people around my age or other people who are pre-symptomatic right and lauren i mean i totally agree where you know it's a lot it's a lot to process uh all of this right you know it's not like the, you know the three of us uh you you know me you and bj like just woke up we're like yeah we're gonna start to get more involved in the fda stuff like it it happened over time because i think we kind of eventually got out of like doing the fundraising and, and, you know, maybe doing less of like the, you know, smaller volunteer roles and now these bigger leadership roles. And I think that's an opportunity for a lot of people, um, whether you're in the U S or, you know, outside the U S and, you know, North America, South America, Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, Antarctica. I said them all. I said them all. Did I? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, but like, my point is, is like, I, I think it's, it's a matter of just like figuring out what you enjoy doing and trying to make the most of it, but also don't be afraid to share your story and, and to 
advocate uh, not just to your you know local patient advocacy organization but you know it, it doesn't hurt to reach out uh, you know that's kind of what I started to do I reach out to some of these like pharma companies and just say hey I'm interested in learning more can, can you share what you're able to share and kind of building those relationships to allow me to then build other relationships within you know the healthcare space uh, to get to where we are today I think that's really important. I think too, um, there are a few programs that already exist in order to really get that support. I think from people who are pre-symptomatic sharing their stories, even on a micro and macro level. Uh, so HDO has our ambassadors and that's a set of, of global young people who have experienced so many different things um, impacted by HD, whether you're a caregiver, pre-symptomatic, um, even some people who have early symptoms and things to that nature, to have that support network built in. But then as they are able and wanting, they can get more involved in a way that they feel safe and supported. It's not a, a requirement that people get outwardly involved, but at the very least of it, it's understanding that there's this group of people who also get it. And with the fact that it's international, you even get a bigger outreach and webcasted, which is so powerful and important. Um, and then two, we've got our uh, International Young P Young Adult Congress coming up in March in Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, we'll be announcing some more opportunities for scholarships soon, but um, I think that this is a really great way to physically be with so many people impacted and also have that tie-in, as Seth mentioned, with the scientific community, because they'll be walking around you and they want to hear from you. And so even just whether you're at whatever convention you're going to or meeting, if you see someone in the scientific community, introduce yourself because they want to get to know you and hear your experiences. And that's so important. So there are a lot of great ways to get involved at whatever level, at whatever comfortability you would like. So, you know, always reach out to us if you'd like to get more involved or, or just hear more about that. I also think that we need to remember to like, we got here, we started this because we felt like we were running out of time. We don't have the time for this. And I remember in, in my twenties, I didn't feel that way. <laughs> you know, it was like, okay, I've got time and it kind of sneaks up on you. So if there's one thing that I could say is that don't think that you that you have the time. Um, we're not there yet. So um, when you're 20 and you think, oh, I've got time, it's going to be there for me. Yeah, we were 20 and we thought that too. And we're in our 30s now. I'm 36, going to be 37. And reality is that time is not on my side. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a lot closer than I ever expected. And it's not there for me. So, you know, if I could change one thing, it would be um, to not think that I had the time and that something was going to be there for me. I'd just keep fighting even harder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's just the sad truth of HD, right? Like we want to sit there and live our lives and I'm not saying not to, I'm just saying like, be realistic in this, um, and realize that 10 years goes by fast. 16 years goes by fast. Um, and all of a sudden you're at a place where you're like, damn it, there's a, there's another backtrack or, or setback and, and that just cost me time. So. Um, and I think that that's why these, this listening session is so important because it was kind of that first step, especially with communicating directly with the FDA who apparently had not heard about the experiences specifically from the community Thinking through it, Seth, what were some of your takeaways being an organizer uh, after after the call? I know I was on it and it was impressive to see how many members of FDA were on there. Um, but from kind of not having realistic ex or really any expectations of, of going in, what were your big takeaways? Well, first I was like, I can finally rest. <laughs> I remember Laura texted me, she's like, how do you feel? I'm like, I'm great. Like I'm ready to, you know, hibernate for a day just to get back into it and I think that's fine right it's important of self-care and taking breaks but it was really cool I mean they they told us there's going to be like 20 or 30 people and then there's freaking 50 people listening to us and you, you know you got the director of neuroscience Billy Dunn who they're like yeah they're probably not going to say much and he I think you know we went over time and he was talk. he probably could have talked for another 20 minutes but just hearing him and like I think that was cool that he is passionate about the space too and they wouldn't have taken this request if they didn't find interest in it. So 
knowing how many people were there, how many different like departments were there was really just remarkable. Um, but I, it's a stepping stone, right? And I think the next step is really to bring some of these collaborate collaborators together again. Uh, you know, the, the hope is to try to do it sooner rather than later. So, you know, perhaps at the Huntington Study Group Conference in November to come together and, and talk about this and say, here is what we want the next steps to be. And like, let's have a conversation about it. Uh, you know, you got to dive deeper into the research side of things, which requires not just time and energy, but also, you know, perhaps funding support, right? Because I was doing this on, you know, on the side is, you know, I have a full-time job and everything. And so I think that's the big thing is to do like a preference research kind of study uh, or survey. It takes more time and it takes experts who, who do this for a living to help get involved. And I think that's where we can go. We just need to find the right people to be bought into it. And I think we, we have a good stepping stone. It's just a matter of getting more people to, you know, come aboard the, uh, the pre-symptomatic train. If mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, DJ, what were your what were your takeaways? Takeaways, sorry, I had to step away. Um, just takeaways in general. Yeah, from the listening session. Yeah, um, a lot of excitement. I mean, personal um, fulfillment and refueling to keep going, keep the conversation going, bring people together. I, I didn't mean to be negative earlier, but in general, it's just it's how how do we how do we figure out to to move the needle. Um, and which needle do we need to move and where do we need to move it? This isn't an easy puzzle to put together. Super confusing, super hard. And that's unfortunately science in, in clinical development. Um, but I do think there's a role that, that we as the patient advocacy community can do. And uh, we're excited to, to get rolling and looking forward to partnering with the many advocacy organizations and pharma companies and hopefully a little bit more with, uh, with the FDA on the line as well. Lauren. Um, so I went in really not expecting more than like 15, 20 people, like Seth said, and to see um, the number actually got up to 65 at one point. And I remember just like thinking to myself, my God, there's 65 people on this call listening to us. That is amazing. And then Bill Dunn comes on at the end and starts talking about how he really has an interest in this. And he took the time. That's not something I ever expected. Um, so it was a huge moment for me. Um, really made what we were doing so much more impactful because it was not somebody I was expecting that high up to be on. Um, I, like Seth, had to to kind of rest afterwards. I had to turn off everything and go to sleep. Because um, when you're sharing that much of yourself, with a group of people and you've been working on it for months, um, it it's hard, right? Afterwards to be like, oh my God, it's all done and, and you gotta rest. It's kind of like a fundraiser that you do, you know, or any type of advocacy thing. Um, but I feel hope, right? I feel like we were actually heard and I feel um, very happy about that. And I am very excited about what's to come. Um, and how I can help in that way. Cause that, yeah, it was an amazing experience. Yeah. I think that the sheer number of people I was texting with both Seth and BJ throughout it. Uh, and it was, it was amazing to see that many people. It was a, a big turnout. It was fantastic. Um, I know that um, I, I think one of the things that's really important is I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about the process, but I know that with the FDA and BJ mentioned this, that they already had some of that infrastructure in place to have some of these meetings and to go through kind of the, the different step, the phases and things like that to get these listening sessions scheduled. I think what's important, especially to keep talking to people who are maybe in countries that don't have anything like this set up, is that my guess is, is that this was created because of the voices of advocacy communities wanting to have the opportunity to chat with the FDA. With the FDA. So as you are thinking about, is there a mechanism for you to maybe do something similar in your country? 
it has to start from somewhere, even if this process doesn't exist. And so I think it's important to really start to look into that if this is something that you're interested in replicating. Um, and I know I'd love to hear from, from you all what what you would encourage the community to do, whether that's specifically in the US or in other countries um, to see this trend continue. I would just say, start talking to people, um, ask questions. You know, Seth and I didn't know the answers. We still don't know the answers. Um, we got pointed here by people, um, by just being curious and being passionate and, you know, found, um, the tools. So I, I'm not saying other countries have these tools, but you don't know uh, until you look and until you're asking the right questions to the right people. So if we can help along the way, um, we can guide anybody on some thoughts, but uh, don't just assume that you don't have it either. So I think that um, one of the things that I learned from this whole thing was um, Seth and BJ and I had a ton of talks between us to pharmaceutical companies, to different stakeholders, um, you know, and we, and we would talk about what they said and share just kind of information and um, which kind of led us to this, okay, everybody is saying that it, it's the FDA, right? So I would say, you know, make sure that you have those conversations. Don't be afraid to talk to, <laughs> to the scientists and the researchers. Don't be afraid to, to find out the information. Um, we got some really good information from some, and we got negative feedback from others. And, you know, we learned um, basically where to go. And Seth and BJ were able to then figure out the FDA listening session, but it all came from talking to all those stakeholders and talking to the pharmaceutical companies and, and having those conversations. Um, so don't be afraid to have the conversations. Don't be afraid to share your story mm -hmm. um, and don't think that it's not important. So if that's one, if that's probably the biggest thing is that our story matters and the FDA listening session really showed that. So be willing to share your story because every single one is important. Um, in order for us to to get where we need to be. Yeah, and I would just say, like, don't try to reinvent the wheel. I mean, for us, like, we first asked others to say, like, where's thing, where have things been? Like, what's the deal with, like, say, biomarkers of, like, looking at different changes happening in the brain? And what does that, how does that relate to those who are pre-symptomatic? What's been, like, you know, pushed out in articles or publications? And then just seeing, you know, what has already been done and then what can we do? And I think that's kind of where we took that approach of saying, okay, well, let's apply and see what happens. And then when they told us like they've never heard from the, you know, this type of community before, a pre-symptomatic community, that's where we're like, okay, we're on to something. And that's where we were also having conversations with other autosomal dominant, you know, conditions, whether it's ALS or prion disease or a few others uh, that I can't all time or Alzheimer's, you know, like, I think there's a, a bunch of others in the community. And I think like, you know, there's two angles. One is continue this path and try to, sh you know, shape it in some sense for other communities or, you know, long-term. And we discussed this with a few other advocates for other condition areas is do we, you know, come together and try to rally as a, pre-symptomatic you know community for autosomal dominant conditions because that also provides a louder voice and it provides you know more than just you know a few of us talking about it it's hundreds thousands of people who are saying hey we need to do something now to change the way we look at not just hd but these other conditions mm -hmm. so long way to go but i think for anyone who's interested just have conversations start talking to people you know reach out to us if you if you want to chat uh, but it I don't think there's anything wrong with just learning about what's already been out there or been done and then seeing if you can either A, help and, and join those efforts or perhaps collaborate with others and, and start something yourself. I think by something you, yourself, I'm not, not saying an organization, I'm saying like, you know, an initiative and bringing other people on board. 
Well, I was going to say too, uh, in, for those in other countries, uh, check out what your local associations are doing too, if there is an HD association, because they may have some connections and um, just haven't looked at it as well. So I think, as everybody has mentioned, just starting to have those conversations and you, you will never know what doors are open until you start. So I think that that's an important aspect as everybody's reiterated. Um, before we take off um, from this conversation, but much, many more conversations to have. What are some lasting words you all would like to leave the community? Um, next steps, endeavors, hopes, dreams. Hopes and dreams. Um, <laughs> so many. Uh, you know, what, where we want to go from here is it, we have a lot of the community data that that we think just needs some like advancement on, like for a couple things. One. We want to do a bigger survey to this piece of population um, to do two things. One, to get more of their insights, but also kind of to do the whole wake up thing to get them to understand that, hey, there are like, holy cow, there are clinical trials available today for people who are very early or even pre-symptomatic. I, I think market research could help make some awareness. But um, but also we want to, we want to have a, a conversation with the FDA. You know, the patient listening session wasn't a conversation. It was us speaking and them listening. Um, but we want to get their thoughts. And um, we also want to make sure that we get their thoughts on what can be the most valuable to the many HD stakeholders. So that's uh, that's what we hope to get in place. But Seth, I don't know. You, you have a little more details you want to share uh, um, on those steps. I do. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I... I would just say just, yeah, it's, it's diving deeper into the data, uh, trying to figure out more information and then, yeah, have a conversation with them and other stakeholders to then, you know, the hopes and dreams is that each study has a sub arm of, uh, you know, we're offering it to pre-symptomatic uh, community members. I think the goal, right, is treat as early as possible with any condition, right? And if we know with the clinical data that changes happen, you know, 15 plus years prior to clinical onset, then let's start treating, you know, as soon as someone tests and it's ethical, of course, but like giving them the opportunity to make that decision, right? And, and saying, hey, here's the risk I am willing to take. And I think we can gather some of that information that would help to say, okay, yeah, would I rather deal with X versus HD symptoms, right? Headaches versus HD symptoms, probably headaches, right? Depending on how often it is, of course, but give us a chance to at least answer these questions. Um, and then personally, uh, participate in a study. I'm going to tell other people to participate. I got to put my money where my mouth is and uh, participate myself. So looking at some options of what's currently available and seeing what it entails, seeing if it's, you know, feasible just from, you know, a travel and taking time off and things like that. But that's kind of the, the personal thing. And then trying to find something that uh, slows it down. Of course, that's the end goal. Um, hopes and dreams and thoughts. Um, first, I, I want to thank Seth and BJ for even involving me in this. Um, had I not gotten contacted by them, um, you know, I don't, I don't know where I would be with this. And it has been a lifesaver for me because of the fact that it was right after my dad. So realize that you have a whole community so, to support you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those people become your extended family, um, you know, and really your, your friends become a family. Um, I really like these guys have dealt with me so much in the past year and I'm so grateful to them. Um, that would be my personal thing is, is just realize you've got a whole community behind you. You're not doing this alone. Um, if you need, um, advice from anybody, we're here, you know, or if you need support from anybody and, um, that's really what I've learned in this journey in the past year. Um, you know, obviously the goal is for us to treat as early as possible, as Seth said, and, and I think that it's going to take a lot of collaboration. I think that the community worldwide has to collaborate on this to get to where we need to be in clinical trials. This is not just in the United States. This is not just in a couple other countries. This is worldwide that we have to have pre-symptomatic people in clinical trials and and involved in research um, to to get to where we need to be. 
um, as BJ said, it's, it's part of waking up that community and um, we got to figure that part out and got to get busy on that so we don't lose any more time. So I'm just grateful for the opportunity, grateful to see where it goes and hope I can help others in the community um, get to where we are. So. Great. Well, thank you all so much for sharing today. We do have information at hdo.org about some of the uh, results and uh, report about the FDA listening session. I'll put a link in the details, um, but you can also just head over to hdo.org and look at our, our news section. And uh, if you are interested in learning more about how you can get involved and engaged, let us know. We're happy to connect you with Seth or BJ or Lauren, or you can stalk them online as well on their different social media channels. But we're so grateful for all of the work that you all did, the other advocates who shared their story uh, during the session, the FDA, for listening, OptioBio to helping um, construct the survey and, and all of the countless hours that you all put in and, and much more to come. So thank you on behalf of the community and um, we can't wait to see what the next steps are. And thank you all for watching. Please share, uh, share this information with others because as we've mentioned, really communicating with young people in the community can be challenging because life happens and we know that. So continue to encourage others to get involved in whatever way that they possibly can. But for today, we'll sign off on this HDU community stories. And as always, reach out if you need anything, we're all here for you. Have a great day.